All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar, belated as it may be. Uh, and and thank you enormously for being a part of this Shell Day effort. And also, thank you for being a part of local water monitoring. We are really excited that there are now more than 50 different organizations that are participating in Shell Day. And needless to say, but each of you is a part of stewardship efforts and for the environment and for communities near you. And it is just amazing to have such fantastic participation in this research project. And water monitoring is an increasingly important form of leadership as some of our favorite places are really up against some big changes and challenges from both global stressors and local transitions and a lot of pressure on our ecosystems. And the important and also fun work that you do as scientific observers and as caretakers on the water it's perhaps now more necessary than ever before. And new challenges like ocean and coastal acidification are really a call to action for science-based problem solving. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with this project. The problem with coastal acidification is that there isn't really a one-size-fits-all approach. And throughout the Northeast, there is a huge range of water conditions and marine ecologies. And there's also a huge range of different vulnerability, even from one embayment to the next. So the answer to this challenge is the work and the volunteerism that each of you is a part of, having local water monitoring and having monitoring efforts that really engage and adapt to multiple local concerns, not just acidification, not just climate change, not just local water quality, but balancing all of these local needs at once. And that's why the partnership that is leading Shell Day, which is the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network, has really been working to encourage our region's ability and capacity to monitor and research acidification in the first place. And in particular, it's been important to share the message that coastal acidification is a water quality issue and that coastal communities can and should care about this problem. And this is because local factors can influence coastal acidification. And it also means that some of those local factors are within our local control. So the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network has really tried to put together the best resources to help differentiate those local factors and to understand opportunities for mitigation and adaptation. And fortunately, we have a really strong community of people actively engaged in water monitoring throughout our region. And the, the names of these organizations alone do not share the richness and the depth of how these programs are at the interface of local decision making and environmental protections. And you also might see that these water monitoring programs collectively have enormous potential to start working together. And many of the groups are especially for coastal acidification, we are really excited about this opportunity. And when we look at the span of water monitoring stations throughout the Northeast Coast, and this is a GIS layer that we've been working to put together over the past year with many of your information. Um, when we look at this range, it's just an incredible opportunity to start thinking about monitoring networks for coastal acidification, but also for other issues. And as your monitoring programs have developed over time, a lot of the parameters and science questions that you're investigating really interface with our understanding of coastal acidification in the first place. So many of these groups, many of your programs are already measuring the parameters that are most important to understanding coastal acidification. And the effect of coastal acidification on biology and our marine, on our marine ecosystems 
it's really a new science. There is a lot that we're starting to uncover. And this Shell Day effort for simultaneous and for crowdsource monitoring, it's a new approach for research. So I, I can't stress enough that we're really excited to have you on board. And for the rest of the webinar, we're gonna review some of the details that will help you to participate in this study and go over some of the sampling methods that you'll undertake on the 22nd. And there should be lots of time for questions and conversation. Again, apologies to get the webinar started a little late, but hopefully many of you can stay on for that part of the discussion. So next, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you both a fantastic colleague and an expert carbon chemist from the University of New Hampshire. Chris Hunt has been an integral leader in helping with the science behind Shell Day. And Chris is gonna share a little bit more about the hypotheses and the biogeochemistry behind this project. So thanks again, Chris, all yours. Thanks, Parker. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Give me a sec to bring up my screen and we'll get started. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that all right. Um, so thanks again, Parker, for the introduction. Um, as you said, my name is Chris Hunt and I'm a research scientist at the University of New Hampshire. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about total alkalinity, which is the um, primary parameter that we're going after for Shell Day and why uh, it's an interesting thing for everybody to take a look at. And um, some of the ideas that we're hoping to explore with the data that will hopefully come out of this effort. Um, so total alkalinity is a chemical definition. Um, it's, a, it's an umbrella that contains a number of different chemical species. And the technical definition is that total alkalinity is the number of moles of hydrogen ion equivalent to the excess of proton acceptors over proton donors. And um, there might be some who know what that means. There's probably a lot of people who are scratching their heads. Um, but a much easier way to think about total alkalinity is that it's the capacity of ocean water to neutralize acid. And you can think of it as the chemical buffering capacity of the ocean um, or the ability of seawater to resist acidification. You can even think of it as like an antacid in the, dissolved in the ocean. And the reason that total alkalinity is important is that as um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases, the global ocean pH is projected to decrease. Um, some projections are very severe. And that can lead to a number of effects on important biogeochemical species. And so the primary mechanism by which um, this decrease in pH is neutralized is through uh, the levels of total alkalinity. In, in the ocean, as oceanographers, we have a pretty simple conceptual model of um, how total alkalinity is circulated through the ocean. Uh, and it basically mirrors the calcium cycle. So rivers are one of the primary inputs of total alkalinity into the surface ocean. And together with the rivers, you have inputs from um, from sediments and even from volcanic activity. And then you have mixing in the ocean through different layers, and you have movement between surface and deep water. And then you can also have removal as carbonate minerals are formed and deposited on the seafloor. So that's our that's our basic cartoon understanding of total alkalinity in the ocean. But then when, when I started thinking about how total alkalinity um, circulates in the coastal ocean, the picture becomes much different. I'm oh, sorry, I had some illustrations there, but just showing inputs from rivers and from the seafloor and then uh, removal as materials deposited. But here in the coast, I tried to make a diagram um, which is extremely complicated and which you should not try and understand uh, as a whole, 
but just appreciate that in the coastal area, there are many more processes which can influence alkalinity, which can influence this buffering capacity. And um, understanding uh, where alkalinity might be higher or lower, or where it may be affected by um, chemical or biological processes becomes a really complex issue. And one that uh, up until recently um, hasn't been explored very thoroughly, and we still have a lot of gaps in our knowledge about a lot of these processes. A lot of these are still new concepts that are being studied um, even as we speak. But the main message from this is just that things near the coast get really complicated really fast. Um, and so up till now, as oceanographers, we've had some tools that we've been able to use to estimate alkalinity. Um, so the map on the left shows a, an assembly of thousands of measurements of alkalinity throughout the ocean. And you can see that some areas are more well studied than others in this assessment. You can see that our area in the northeast is um, pretty empty. Um, the map on the right shows a more updated version of this. Uh, a lot of the same data are in both, and there's some additional data in the map on the right. Um, but the, the map on the bottom right is a diagram of um, the most productive fisheries in the world. And I like these three plots because they show that there's a real disconnect between where we have the most information about alkalinity and buffering and, and potential ocean acidification commissions. Where we have the most information is not where the fish are. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect between um, areas of perhaps economic or environmental interest and the areas that we've spent, we as oceanographers have spent a lot of time characterizing. But we have tools and these tools are evolving pretty rapidly. So one of the primary tools that we have is the observation that total alkalinity tends to vary in conjunction with salinity. So salinity is the level of salt, the level of dissolved ions in the ocean, and the same processes that affect total alkalinity generally affect salinity. And so this is a useful observation and a really great opportunity as oceanographers to fill in some of these gaps. So these plots show a satellite map of salinity on the bottom from the Aquarius satellite, and then um, computed estimates of total alkalinity on the top plot. And you can see that there's just broad stroke covariance. You can see the same features in both maps. So this, this interrelationship with salinity uh, offers a lot of opportunities for us. But you can see that even with satellites, um, when we zoom in on our own northeast area, uh, things get kind of kind of blurry, and um, there's a lot of information that can still be filled in, especially in the coastal area. So zooming in even further, um, these are data that we at UNH have collected in here in the southern Gulf of Maine, um, along with some of the published relationships between salinity and total alkalinity. And um, you can see that some relationships fall pretty closely on, on our observation data, and some of the other published relationships are further away from our observations. Um, so some of the these tools seem to work well for our, for our particular area, some uh, seem more limited, but um, all these tools are based on limited data and tend to be sampled further away from the shore. And so right now, the best assembly of data I th that I've seen comes from uh, a series of four cruises that have been done up and down the East Coast in 2007, 12, 15, and 18. Um, they get pretty close to the shore, um, but they're still mostly concentrated in this cross-shelf gradient. And, but we're starting to move, as oceanographers, we're starting to move closer and closer to the land. Um, so these are, and we know that um, rivers, in, in particular in the Gulf of Maine in this table, can carry very different alkalinity loads. So these are some data from a paper we did where we took river end member samples um, from a series of different rivers all up and down the Gulf of Maine coast. And there's 
you can see that there's a, a wide variability in how much alkalinity some of these rivers are discharging from very high alkalinity up in the, the St. John Canada region to very low alkalinity in some of the downeast rivers to you know low to medium amounts in uh, some of the other major rivers. So we know a little bit about which rivers might have higher lows or lower lows, but we know less about how that river-borne alkalinity combines with coastal water masses and then how local processes then uh, determine the alkalinity in like a local embayment or a local estuary. Um, all right, we can ignore that. And so, so finally here, but we do know a little bit, and um, this project offers us a really nice opportunity to add to that knowledge. So these are four, four systems, the St. John, the Merrimack, the Pleasant, and the Pleasant, which is a little uh, down east river, and the Androscog and Kennebec. And you can see that the, um, the general trend between alkalinity and salinity is similar, but there are some, some pretty interesting differences between these systems. Um, and so again, this mixing curve and these questions start to offer some real opportunities for a distributed effort like Shell Day. Um, and so finally, I'd like you to just put up this plot, which is um, some new data from the East Coast from 2017 from a shipborne alkalinity sensor, um, where we are looking at regions of elevated or perhaps lower alkalinity. Um, so these data are all normalized to the same salinity. And so um, higher numbers indicate a relatively higher concentration of alkalinity than, than lower numbers. And you can see that there's some broad spatial patterns along the East Coast. And you can see that in 2017, it seems like the Gulf of Maine, at least parts of it, were kind of a hotspot for enhanced alkalinity. And so there, there's still a lot of questions and there's a lot of knowledge gaps that we have. And hopefully Shell Day will contribute to some of those. Um, hopefully Shell Day will allow groups to put alkalinity into a local perspective. Uh, it may enable us to identify regions or systems of particular interest and it will hopefully add to our knowledge of these salinity, alkalinity interactions in the New England region. And I just wanted to put in a quick plug. Um, there's a longer webinar archived on the NECAN website that go, goes further into alkalinity distributions. So if you want to learn more, that can be another resource for you. And so now we sort of a, that's sort of a broad science overview of uh, alkalinity, why we're interested in it, why we're excited that um, so many of you have signed up to help sample it. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Jenny Rubin from Woods Hole, who's going to talk about some of the nuts and bolts about the sampling program. So take it away, Jenny. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris and Parker, for uh, that great introduction. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen and hear me. Um, so as uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Jenny Ruban. I am uh, from Woods Hole Sea Grant and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of the details about Shell Day and the actual sampling uh, that we're asking you guys to do. So uh, we've given you uh, sampling protocols and a data sheet, and I'm going to go through all of that detail now. What we've outlined is uh, three basic sampling protocols for actually collecting your water samples. Um, the bucket sampling protocol, what we're calling it, the pole sampling and uh, hand sampling. And uh, which of these methods you choose is absolutely up to you. Uh, and I suspect is gonna be largely dependent on whether you can reach the water body that you're sampling in uh, from a dock or from a boat, uh, or whether you can't if you're sampling off a bridge or if the water level is low at low tide. Uh, or if you also already have um, an extendable pole that you use to collect water samples already. Um, all three of these methods are um, pretty similar. Uh, and again, the main difference is um, pretty much just how you actually collect the bulk water sample uh, to fill your bottles with. Um, so the three methods all have about six major steps. Um, we're asking you to measure temperature and salinity either in the water body itself or in uh, the bulk water sample you might collect from a bucket. Uh, we're asking you to rinse uh, whatever apparatus that you might use to collect your water sample. 
Uh, we're asking you to rinse your bottles for total alkalinity three times, uh, fill the bottle, uh, put that bottle on ice and in the dark, and uh, fill out your data sheet with all of the important information. Uh, so I'll go through this in a little bit more detail uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, we're asking uh, groups to collect samples at low tide, at mid tide, and at high tide. And that's a pretty significant uh, time commitment, and we're incredibly appreciative of um, everyone for their willingness and their excitement in participating in Shell Day. Um, a typical tidal cycle might um, have you guys collecting these water samples over the course of about six hours. Um, so, you know, you need to be prepared to, you know, go back out to your field site um, multiple times over the course of the day. Uh, we're also asking that uh, you collect duplicate samples at low tide and at high tide. Um, and I hope uh, everyone should have received by now or will be receiving shortly um, sampling packets from your regional coordinator, uh, which should have five bottles in them that will uh, that are pre-labeled and will be used for uh, your shell day sampling. Okay, so uh, just a brief list of things you'll probably need when you go out in the field. Uh, you'll need a way to collect your water. So depending on the method that you're using, you might need a bucket, uh, such as a you know five gallon bucket you might get from a home improvement store, uh, the ex an extendable pole uh, that you might uh, already have, or if you want to make one, we've also included in the protocols uh, some instructions for how to fabricate one. You'll want to bring out uh, your five sample bottles. Uh, that'll be uh, five samples per site. Uh, you'll need instruments for measuring temperature and salinity, uh, which with whatever method that you are planning to use. Uh, you'll need uh, your data sheet as well as your sampling protocols in case you wanted to refer back to those uh, for uh, reference. Uh, you'll need a cooler that's full of ice, and that's really important because uh, we need uh, these samples to go immediately on ice in a cooler after collection because we want to inhibit or reduce the amount of biological activity that might happen within the sample uh, before it makes it to the lab. Uh, you'll need a pen and pencil uh, to write down all of your data on your data sheet. Um, and if you have a camera or, you know, you can use your phone, please uh, take lots of pictures. We'd love to see what your field sites look like. We'd like to see, you know, you guys out collecting your um, samples. You know, we plug you guys on social media and really it would be really exciting to see where all of these uh, data are being collected. So we've uh, created a video uh, for that follows the bucket sampling protocol as a how-to for sampling on Shell Day. Um, and uh, I will hand over to Emily to show this video. So this is uh, available on Hui's YouTube uh, web channel. You can also find it. It's been embedded on the Shell Day website. Uh, so if you need to refer back to this, you know, please uh, take a look. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so right before I hit play, uh, I just wanted to say that um, the quality of the video might not be perfect because we're, th we're showing it through the GoToWebinar um, platform. Um, you should be able to hear it just fine, but the, the visuals might be a little bit staticky. But again, uh, just as Jenny said, it is currently up on the Shell Day page, uh, so you can refer back to it at any time. Um, so I'll hit play now. Today we're here in Woods Hole and I'm going to be showing you how to collect a water sample for total alkalinity for Shell Day 2019. So the first thing I'm going to do when we get to our field site is measure the temperature and salinity of our water body. I'm using a multi-parameter data sound, so I'm going to be collecting temperature and salinity out of the water body itself. Okay, it's really important to make sure we know the time that we collected that measurement. Uh, so I'm going to write that down on our data sheet. We're going to be using the bucket sampling protocol today. There are other methods you can use for your water sampling protocol, and that information can be found on the Shell Day website. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is rinse our bucket. We want to make sure we avoid cross-contamination between samples. So we're going to take our bucket and fill it roughly a quarter of the way. We're going to mix our water around, swirl to rinse the bucket, and then 
dump that water downstream of where we're collecting our sample. Once your bucket is rinsed, we're going to fill the bucket and that will be your water sample for shell day. If you're using another method for measuring temperature and salinity, you should collect that temperature and salinity measurement from the bucket now. To collect our water sample, we're going to take our pre-labeled bottle and we're going to rinse this bottle three times. We're going to put it into the bucket with the lid on, open the lid underwater, let that bottle fill. We're going to dump out about half, half of that water, put the cap back on, take your bottle to rinse, and dump that rinse water out. We're going to repeat those rinses two more times for a total of three times. Okay, now we're going to fill the bottle for our water sample for total alkalinity. So again, it's going to be the same as if we were rinsing. We're going to leave the cap on, put the bottle into the bucket, open the cap, let the bottle fill, and dump a small amount of water out to allow for headspace for thermal expansion of your sample. Then we're going to take our water sample and put it immediately on ice in a cooler. And if you were collecting samples at low tide or high tide, which would have duplicate samples, you would collect that duplicate sample out of the same bucket that you've already collected your first sample out of. Then we're going to fill out the rest of our data sheet with our temperature and salinity information and our bottle number. The sample will be stored overnight in the dark in your cooler and transported on August 23rd to the participating lab open house uh, for dropping that sample off. Thank you for participating in Shell Day 2019. Excellent. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, so that we went through the uh, sampling protocol for the bucket sampling. Um, the other two protocols are pretty are very similar, and I'll go through them uh, in uh, text and and talk to those quickly. Great. So um, again, this is the text that you'll have on your um, SOP that we gave you. Uh, but again, just to go through this for the bucket sampling. Uh, or the uh, hand sampling protocol or the pole sampling. If you're using a multi-parameter data sound, uh, we are asking you to measure temperature and salinity um, as you normally would in the water body itself, um, about 15 centimeters below the water surface. Um, as I said, it's important to rinse your sampling apparatus, so either that's the bucket or the pole. Um, uh, if you're using the bucket method and you're using a different uh, method for temperature and salinity, such as a thermometer and a refractometer, um, we're asking that you measure the temperature and salinity out of the bucket uh, before you collect your water sample. Then you'll rinse the sample bottle, uh, keeping the cap on, um, and uh, dump out about half the water after you fill it, uh, and dump that water out. Shake the bottle to rinse, sorry, and dump that out, and you'll repeat that rinse three times. And finally, fill the bottle in the same way that you did the rinse, uh, dump out a small amount of that water um, to leave a headspace in the cap of the bottle, in the top of the neck of the bottle. You'll cap it and you'll put it on ice in the cooler. Then you'll fill out all the rest of the data in your data sheet. If it's, again, if it's duplicate samples and you're using the bucket method, uh, you'll collect your second sample out of the same bucket that you've collected the first sample. Okay, so if you're doing the hand sampling protocol, uh, the protocol is almost identical uh, to the bucket sampling protocol, except rather than filling your uh, sample bottle in the bucket, you'll fill the sample bottle from the water body itself. Uh, and for the pole sampling protocol, again, it's very similar to the other two. Uh, you'll, instead of rinsing the bucket, uh, you would rinse the end of your pole uh, and uh, collect the samples using an extendable pole. Okay, so I'll walk you now through the data sheet itself uh, with the information that we're asking you guys to record. So this is what the data sheet looks like. Uh, hopefully, again, you'll have either taken a look at it. I think everybody probably has seen them either via email or on the Shell Day website. Um, all of this information can be downloaded from the Shell Day website if you uh, have lost yours for whatever reason. Uh, so this, it all should be available online. 
So we're asking for uh, you to fill out the name of the organization that you are uh, sampling for, as well as your name here in the field data recorder section, as well as anyone else who may be out in the field with you. Uh, we're asking that you record the name of your station, as well as the name of the estuary or the water body that you're uh, collecting your sample from. If you happen to know if there's a wild or aquaculture shellfish near where you're collecting your sample, we'd love to know. Uh, so you could circle yes, no, or unknown if you don't know, and that's fine too. Uh, we'd like to know the uh, um, latitude and longitude of your station location. Uh, for um, uh, yeah, so, so we'd like to know the latitude and longitude of your station. Also, uh, the tides, uh, the time of low tide, mid tide, and high tide varies considerably across the region where everybody is going to be collecting their samples. Uh, so we're asking you to determine what the best time is for you to go out and collect your samples. Uh, so we'd also like to know where that reference station is located, the name of that station, um, uh, close to your sampling site that you're using to determine when you should go out in the field. Also, we'd like to know if there's rainfall or if there has been rainfall in the last 24 hours uh, that's going to affect alkalinity, and uh, it's an important thing for us to know. So we'd like to know uh, how much rain happened uh, in the last 24 hours. Okay, so we've uh, made these boxes for your sampling uh, for low tide, mid tide, and high tide uh, with information that we would like to have. Uh, so we have uh, if you have a way to record water depth, that would be great at your station, as well as if you're measuring secchi disk depth, uh, we'd like to know that, as well as air temperature, uh, cloud cover percentage, and do your best to estimate these things. Um, current weather, if you have um, a sense, and the sea state. Uh, we um, are asking you to sample uh, just below the water surface, so every for everybody, uh, this sample depth will be about 0 0.15 uh, centimeters or 0 0.15 meters, excuse me, uh, the time that your sample uh, was collected, um, as well as the required parameters here are in this section here where we're asking for water temperature and salinity. Um, and we've left room for any additional parameters that you may have uh, the capacity to measure, such as dissolved oxygen or pH, or we've also left some empty space if you uh, have um, other parameters that you might measure with a, a sonde or other instruments such as turbidity or chlorophyll concentration. Finally, uh, the most important part uh, for you to take note of is the bottle numbers that you've been uh, using to uh, collect your alkalinity samples. So we've left um, the space here for you to fill out your bottle numbers. And this is identical for your low tide, mid tide, and high tide samples. Uh, the difference will be uh, you should have duplicate samples at low tide and high tide, so you'll have two bottle numbers uh, to fill out um, for uh, low tide and two bottle numbers for high tide and one bottle number for mid tide. So this data sheet is designed as a double-sided sheet. Uh, so if you print out um, this, we have a second page, uh, which has a box for observations or notes, if there's anything that you want to note during your sampling event. Um, this, we've also uh, asked for some metadata about your additional metadata about your station. So the, the site characteristics, are you collecting samples from upper estuary, mid estuary, lower estuary, or more coastal ocean environments? Uh, what the benthic substrate may be. So that could be uh, sand, mud, rock, algae, seagrass, or if you don't know, that's okay too. You can just say unknown. Uh, we want, we'd like to know what method you're using for your temperature and salinity measurements. Uh, so you might put here a sonde or a multi-parameter sonde in this temperature and salinity box, uh, method box. Uh, and if you're using a sonde, we'd like to know the make and model as well as the date that it was last calibrated. So finally, uh, this data sheet will also serve as a chain of custody form uh, for our QAP for this project. So when you return your samples to the lab, uh, we're asking that you sign and date uh, your data sheet, and it will also be signed and date, dated by the person receiving those samples in the lab. Uh, for the weather conditions or sea state, we've given you some guidance for how to fill out that information. Okay, so um, there's some really important considerations that 
you guys need to plan for, uh, one of which I already mentioned, the tides are not going to be the same across this entire region. So you, uh, your group will need to determine what the best time is for you to go out in the field to collect your samples at low tide, mid tide, and high tide. Um, so that's something that you'll need to plan. Um, also, if there's rain that happens uh, on shell day, it would be unfortunate or sad, but we'll, it still provides us some really important information, and shell day will still happen even if it's going to rain. Um, but we're asking, please, please be safe if you're going out in the field in the rain. Uh, you know, docks that are covered in algae can be very slippery. Um, and be smart about inclement weather. You know, if, if there's thunder and lightning, you know, I, you probably don't want to go out in the field if that's the case. You know, we really want Shell Day to happen, and we really want everyone to go out and sample. Uh, but more importantly, we want everyone to be safe. So, you know, please be careful uh, and in determining uh, whether or not it's safe to go out in the field. Okay, some minor tips and tricks uh, associated with uh, collecting these samples. This it wasn't in the video, but if you have access to latex or nitrile gloves, we would encourage you to wear them uh, while you're collecting your samples to minimize contamination. Total alkalinity is a pretty robust parameter and pretty tough to contaminate, so if you don't have them, it's not a big deal. Uh, but if you do, of course, it's all, it uh, can help reduce that uncertainty. Um, try to keep your data sheet as dry as possible. Uh, you know, the, this data sheet has some really important information on it that we won't be able to reproduce if it gets lost or destroyed. So keeping it dry can really help um, reduce that possibility. As I mentioned, um, it's really important that your samples stay on ice and in the dark. So after you've collected them, immediately put them in a cooler and on ice and keep them in the cooler in the dark until they're returned to the lab. Um, if you know one of the labs were going out and collecting samples, we might take these samples and very shortly afterwards uh, fix them with a poison that would completely inhibit biological activity. This won't happen until your samples uh, get brought to the lab. So in order to reduce that possibility, we want the samples to stay cold and in the dark. Um, the boxes on the data sheet are pretty small uh, for filling out that information. So if you can, you know, try to use a, a pen or a you know small pen or a pencil rather than a fat-tipped one like a Sharpie, uh, which could be tough for us to read uh, and interpret. And if you can. Uh, try to write legibly if possible. I know it, sometimes things can be tough in the field, so we certainly understand. Um, and finally, you know, make sure that you know what the plan is for how your samples and your data sheets will make it back to the partnering lab. Um, if you don't know now, uh, get in touch with your regional coordinator, um, and uh, that person can help you determine where your samples are supposed to be going and um, and. Uh, uh, what time those samples should go back to your partnering lab. So in case you were wondering, as Parker mentioned earlier, there's more than 50 groups that are participating in Shell Day, which is pretty amazing. Um, this is the extent of the Shell Day sampling, which I have so far, although not all of the um, station locations have been reported yet, so we're still missing that information from some people. Uh, so if you haven't sent your site locations to your regional coordinator, please do. Uh, we'd love to have this information um, before Shell Day happens. Um, but, I mean, this extent is so incredible from Long Island Sound all through coastal Maine, and this is really amazing. You know, I just want to say thank you all of, to all of you organizations for, you know, being willing and excited to participate in Shell Day. This is really, really cool. I think with that, um, I'd be happy, or we'd, I think we'd all be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, I'm going to leave you as the presenter, if you don't mind, just in case we need to go back to any sampling protocols or to the data sheet after a question. Sure. Yep, that um, sounds great. Okay, so the first one is more of a comment. So it, it asks us to emphasize that putting samples on ice does not mean freezing them. It just means keeping them cold by putting them in a cooler full of ice. Yes, um, thank you. That is very important. Please do not put your samples in the freezer. Uh, just put them in a cooler full of ice. Um, next one is, uh, what if they haven't received a sampling kit yet? If you haven't received a sampling kit, uh, please reach out to your regional coordinator. Um, that would be uh, 
I think Parker for Maine, either Carolina Bastidas at MIT or myself for Massachusetts or uh, Katie O'Brien Clayton from Connecticut. If you haven't received it yet, um, I suspect you'll be receiving it in the next couple of days. Okay. Um, when sampling, are gloves necessary? Uh, no, they are not necessary. Um, as I mentioned, total alkalinity is a pretty robust parameter, but if you have them, um, and if you have access to latex or nitrile gloves, we'd encourage you to wear them to try to minimize any additional uncertainty. Okay. Um, so, has the stability of seawater to pH change been studied for samples stored on ice as per the protocol to be used on shell day? Will some microbial respiration, albeit slowed by the cold temperature, be affecting alkalinity? Um, alkalinity is not sensitive to carbon dioxide. So uh, the short answer is <laughs> maybe a little bit, but um, we're hoping that is minimal. Chris, would you comment on that as well? Sure. Um, so there are some microbial processes that can affect um, total alkalinity. I don't think there are good resources on storing samples, unpreserved samples, which uh, were kind of some of the first groups to try it. So uh, we're, we're uh, just, put, by putting samples on ice, we're hoping to slow that down enough and then either preserve the samples the next day or analyze them the next day. And within that time period, try to minimize any uh, microbial activity that might happen. Alright. Okay, so this next one says, we were going to sample from the shore, which means it's not a single GPS point since we have to move with the tide. Is this not ideal? Should we pick a single location that will have water at low, mid, and high tide? That's a tough question. Um, I think it, uh, I, your site choice, you know, one of the, some of the guidance we're using for uh, helping people choose their sites uh, is if you have a long monitoring history at that particular location, um, I would stick with that field, that field site. So if you have been collecting samples from that location for a long period of time, I, I would try to stick with that. If if you have other sites that are easily accessible that you've been monitoring that might be from a dock at a fixed point, um, uh, we could, you know, you might want to consider moving that. But I, I think if it's it's okay uh, for now, uh, for for that site as but um, I, I I think it would be okay. I don't know, Chris or or Parker, would you comment on that as well? Yeah, I would, I, I would just add that if that's the only station that's an option for you, then stick with it, and we're happy to have you participate in Shell Day. Just make a comment on that on the second page of the data sheet. Um, it's, it's ideal to have the same GPS location, um, but it, it's not a, a make or break for participating in the project. Absolutely, and actually I would also note uh, for any other groups that might be waiting into their field site, um, it's important that you be careful when you're collecting your sample to be collecting that sample from upstream of where you're standing uh, so your sample is not contaminated by anything that you might stir up from the sediments while you're wading into your site. Okay, to do a shoreside station, the depth will be the same for high, low, and mid-tide. Is that okay? So I think that's kind of the opposite of the previous question. Um, so I guess my interpretation would that would be that's the same as the previous question, if that's right, if I'm understanding that correctly, because they'll be wading into their site, and so they may be waist deep or something like that at at high, low, at low, mid, and high tide. Oh, okay. Am I interpreting that okay, correctly? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, to do a okay, short yeah, and depth will be the same for high, low, and mid tide. Is that okay? Yep, yeah, and, right. Yes, that's absolutely fine. Uh, just record that on your data sheet. Okay. 
So you discuss spatial variability and alkalinity in the region, but do you know anything about temporal or seasonal variability? Will this one-time sample of alkalinity over the broad region be representative of local conditions? So I'll start on that question and then I'll pass it over to Chris Hunt. Um, it, it's a really exciting part of this project. Shell Day will not in its entirety categorize the whole system across the Northeast. Uh, but we do suspect that there are some pretty um, consistent seasonal patterns. And so it's been discussed in the, in the past that this type of uh, simultaneous sampling could be oriented at, at certain key times of the year. And part of the reason we pick this time in August is we usually see um, kind of a unique uh, signature between uh, respiration and coastal acidification processes in this time in August. So it's an exciting time to see what those conditions look like. Um, but, but we expect that those conditions and that potentially that relationship between salinity and alkalinity would change. For example, in the spring when you have a lot of snow melt and maybe rainfall, we'd expect to see something different. So Shell Day is a, a start in a direction towards this type of monitoring, um, but but we anticipate that there's more to come and we hope that some groups are kind of inspired to take on this hypothesis at a local level on their own in the future as well. But Chris, would you want to add to that? Uh, I think, I think that Parker, you really captured it there. I, I don't think that this one sampling event will fully characterize any particular system or any region. It's just going to give us, like you said, a snapshot. Um, there's certainly seasonal changes and there's certainly pro, uh, interannual variability that we don't understand yet. So this is just a stepping stone to get us started. Um, and there are lots of questions like that that um, we'll, we'll need more study further along the way. Okay, so um, this next question looks like it refers to the data sheet um, where it says reference tide station. Is that the name of the station that your local tides are based on? Yes. Okay, so it says as an example, Castine's tide predictions are based on the Eastport tide gauge. Do you want Castine or, or Eastport as the reference location? So the name of the, the tide station itself. Um, I would say the name of the tide station itself, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it might be the case that, or often it's the case that since you're out on the water and know these systems really well, you'll identify places where the actual high and low tide are pretty different than the tide station nearby. So, it, you know, if you are very confident that you're spot on on the high and low tide for that day, um, just add that into the into the comments box and still put the tide station that's nearest to you just so we have um, pretty consistent reporting on the project at the end. Okay, so um, how would you like the bottles to be labeled? Uh, the bottles should be labeled already. So they'll be pre-labeled, uh, hopefully, uh, when you get them from your uh, regional coordinator. And you do not need to do any additional labeling on the bottle. Perfect. If we are collecting duplicate samples to analyze with our students to compare to the, to compare with the certified lab results, can we bring them to the event on the 23rd and have the fixative added there at the same time the official samples will be fixed? In the case um, that they don't have any mercury chloride in their current inventory. Uh, do these groups have the capacity to safely dispose of samples that have been poisoned with mercury chloride? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that that's I, uh, probably a question for your regional coordinator. So either reach out to, to me or Carolina Bastidas and Jenny or to, or to Katie O'Brien Clayton, and we'll figure out exactly which lab you're gonna be working with um, after, after Shell Day. And um, we can kind of do that more on a case by case method, but really exciting that you're getting some students involved and thanks so much for kind of broadening the impacts of this work. Great. So this particular person that asked the question says that they do have that ability um, to dispose of them after, but that's a good point that you should contact the regional coordinators as well. Okay, let me just go back up.
What is the best website to get information on title stage? Uh, I'd recommend looking at the NOAA um, Tides and Currents website. Uh, they have a pretty extensive um, series of tide stations uh, reported there. Emily, okay. can we put a link to the um, that on the, the Shell Day website? Yeah, definitely. So hope you'll be able to get at that resource easily from our, the Shell Day website. Okay, the next one. Um, would we be able to substitute conductivity for salinity? Otherwise, we can borrow someone else's unit for the day for salinity. If it's, so if it's possible to borrow someone else's calibrated unit, uh, that would be ideal. Okay. The challenge, sorry, the challenge with using uh, conductivity alone is it would need to be calibrated to a salinity value. Okay, so how close to high or low tide time is acceptable in the case that someone is going from one site to a second? Um, do the best that you can uh, to get to your sites in a timely fashion. If it's, uh, you know, a little after high tide or a little before high tide, that, that that's perfectly fine. Just make sure you take a, make a note of it on your um, data sheet. And essentially the reason for this is we're hoping to capture the largest gradient in salinity over a tidal cycle. And so the best that we can estimate that range between high and low tide um, will, will help us to see if we, if we see a stronger relationship between salinity and total al alkalinity. Um, so it, if, it, you know, if, it means, if it means driving like a maniac to get from one site to the next, you, you don't need to. The largest time frame that we've said is allowable is, is up to an hour, but we're really hoping that people can try to hit those tidal cycles at, spot on as best as they're able. Okay. So this one says we're in a harbor group that tests water in PJ Harbor. Would it be better to choose a location in Long Island Sound rather than in the harbor or embayment? No, it's perfectly fine to sample in a harbor or embayment. I think that's a absolutely fine location. In fact, most of the samples I suspect are coming from uh, you know, for locations where I'm not, I haven't been in contact with groups, but I suspect many of these samples are coming from um, harbors or embayments. Okay. And as we're maybe getting towards the kind of latter half of the questions or the tail end of the questions, just to remind folks that this is really the start of a conversation and all the science and staff that have been involved through NECAN so far are really excited to talk with you about these, about this project and other questions that you have around coastal acidification. So don't hesitate to reach out through email or over the phone and, and start to kind of build this network. Yeah, good point. So the next one is similar to one that we've received. Is there a time range when we can sample? For example, if low tide is at 10 a.m., is there a range around 10 a.m. that is acceptable? Parker, you just said up to an hour is okay, but as close as possible is ideal. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Is it required that you collect all three tidal samples in order to participate in Shell Day? Um, we're asking that groups uh, make this commitment. Um, I, I, we realize that it's a, a pretty big time commitment. And if for whatever reason you absolutely cannot go back at low tide at, or mid tide or high tide or at one of these, these times or even two of these times, that's okay too. You know, we want as much participation as possible and, you know, it, we're so incredibly happy that and excited that everybody's participating in this. But we, you know, we really would like, if possible, uh, for groups to go back and collect samples throughout the tidal cycle. 
And we chose the August 22nd date because for the vast majority of the Northeast region, it has a pretty um, practical tidal range. So most of you are going to be sampling around 10 a.m. And, and 4 p.m. or something around those marks. But there's a lot of variation in the different bays and inlets um, in kind of mid-coast northeast. So uh, there, there are at least a couple groups that have a tidal range that's a little bit more inaccessible for your regular workday. And we understand if you're not inclined to be out on the water at 6 a.m. Uh, for a couple groups at least. So um, with that caveat, we're uh, just to echo Jenny, we're really excited about participation. This activity and event is is supposed to be fun and engage people in coastal acidification research. So um, join to the extent that you feel comfortable and that you're excited about the work. If we are sampling from a floating dock, do we need to note the total depth? Total depth is an interesting question because it might allow us to differentiate systems that are um, have a lot more sedimentary activity um, that could be interacting with total alkalinity. So understanding the total depth of the system and, and whether it's driven mostly by oceanic water bodies or whether it's driven by that interface with the marine sediments um, is particularly useful. So to the best that you're able to estimate that, um, we would like to have that data. Um, if you don't have the instruments to measure it directly, um, even some course uh, estimates would, would be helpful for us. And just take a note of that on the data sheet as well. Can we Can use a refractometer to measure salinity? Uh, sorry, there was a little bit of um, feedback. Can you repeat that? Oh, I apologize. Um, can we use a refractometer to measure salinity? Yes, absolutely. Sorry if I did not mention that. Um, yes, you can absolutely use a refractometer. Great. Um, when do you expect the results of total alkalinity will be shared? Uh, that's going to depend a little bit on some of the participating labs. Um, some labs will be able to process samples on, or some of the samples anyway, on the 23rd, in which case we may be able to, some labs may be able to share some data immediately or very soon afterwards. Other labs um, have instruments that take a little bit longer to run samples and it may take, you know, a week or two to get those run. Uh, but I, I think everybody, all of the participating labs would anticipate that well, we should have uh, the samples run, you know, sometime by mid-September, I would expect. And then to add to this conversation is having the results and the data from the 22nd um, is a little bit different of a question from having our full interpretation of the data. And with, with such a diversity in what parameters are going to be measured at each site, we're really excited to see about what types of answers and questions come out of the data set that comes from Shell Day in the first place. Um, so we're hoping to bring you on board for that conversation and to have you involved in data interpretation and different steps of, of how we're looking at the information. Um, so I would anticipate that we'll, we'll have some more webinars or conversations down the road into the fall. Um, and essentially just really excited to see what we get from the Shell Day project. Okay. So the next one, uh, we do just have a couple questions left. I realize we're close to time now, but there's just a few left. Um, will all samples be poisoned with mercuric chloride before delivery or just some? Our lab, uh, Justin Reese, I believe that's uh, Northeastern, um, will be measuring DIC from these samples and DIC is more heavily impacted by microbe respiration than alkalinity. Uh, no samples will be poisoned uh, until they return to the lab, to, until they get uh, brought to the labs. Um, I think I, I suspect most labs will be poisoning samples with mercuric chloride um, unless the samples are being run right away. I'm not sure that yeah, answers that's your the, question. That, yeah, the procedure plan is to is to poison all samples on the collection day that are not able to be analyzed on collection day on the 23rd. 
Okay. For mid-tide samples, does it make a difference if it's flood or ebb? So low tide is in the morning on the 22nd for the region. So all of these samples will be capturing a, a flood tide at that time. And in, in running this work in the future, uh, we don't yet have a set of hypotheses about how uh, ebb or flood tide might be different. But for the 22nd, you'll, you'll capture a low tide in the morning and then a, uh, a flood tide mid and, and then a high tide in the afternoon. And essentially what we're hoping with this is that we'll, in theory, get the maximum range of acidification conditions. It tends to be the case that respiration overnight will drive down pH and create more acidif acidified conditions. And so capturing a low tide that's also influenced by uh, coastal factors um, will kind of be that maximum acidification level in, you know, in the way that we're asking this question and that the afternoon we'd expect higher alkalinity with high tide. Chris, you might explain that in a little bit of a different way. Do you want to uh, confront that question also? Yeah, I mean, we have we have some evidence to show that um, incoming and outgoing tides carry different alkalinity signatures, like for our local system here in Great Bay. We have some data to support that. Um, but right now, I think for consistency, since, as Parker said, we're the first sampling is on a low tide. I think it makes sense to sample for everybody to sample on an incoming tide, just so um, the methodology is consistent. All right, so we have two questions left. Um, the tide height for our sites on August 22nd is only nine feet. It can be as high as 12, so we may not capture as much as a gradient as we see with larger tides. Is this okay? Yes, absolutely. That's fine. Uh, we want to see the, site, the characteristics at your site. So just because you don't have a very large tidal range doesn't mean that, we, uh, that you shouldn't be sampling from that site. That's, uh, that's, part of, that's an important part of the variability that we're trying to capture by sampling across this whole region. Okay, so is there any value in sampling a site which is not tidal, such as a highly constricted estuary? That's a tough question. Um, I would say unless you've already chosen that and have planned on that type of a site, I think um, for consistency for this particular sampling event, it might be... It, uh, you might want to sample a site that is tidal uh, if you have them. If you don't have another sampling site to choose, it's perfectly fine to sample at a site that is not tidal. Chris or Parker, do you want to comment on that also? Um, yeah, this is Chris. I, I think for this effort, um, more is better than less. And so if this is an interesting system, especially if the um, sample collector can make some sort of note about the characteristics of their station. So when we're analyzing the data, we might bear that in mind when looking at the results. Um, I think a, a system like that would be unique, but perhaps uh, interesting to include. All right, well, that was our last question. Um, Thank you everybody for participating in this webinar. Thank you for your patience after the sound issues from the first webinar. Um, we highly encourage you to take pictures on Shell Day and if you use social media to use this hashtag down here on the screen, Shell Day 2019, um, and visit the Shell Day page on NECAN.org. Um, this recording will go there as well as other resources. Parker, did you have anything to add to that? No, this is great. Thank you all for joining the webinar and look forward to all the follow-up questions. And again, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we look forward to working with you directly. All right, then with that, we will sign off. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everybody.